of history in Auckland, one that so many will not forget. For Bell. Bell with a superb goal to Hoppy. Dean Bell on Shaler. Back in field, Hoppy, he got it. Wrapped up all the way by Bell. Dean Bell. Great rusher with Hancock. First of all, let's talk about that moment, that goosebump moment. Uh, what was it like? I mean, because it's a bit of a walk down that tunnel where you heard the drums beating when it was the first time uh, that this club was going to go into battle. What was going through your mind? Do you remember? Yeah, I, don't forget, I, I knew a long time before when I first came back to NZ, you know, for the Warriors, is that I was going to be walking down that tunnel for that first game. So every time at training, I would think about that. I would think about that moment to prepare myself. And um, not that it helped, to be fair. It was, um, yeah, it was, it was surreal. I, I was lucky enough. I mean, you know, I've led the team out at a World Cup final, um, the one we had at Eden Park. Unfortunately, we, you know, we didn't perform that day. But also um, in, um, in three Wembleys, I've uh, led Wigan out as well. So mm. big moments them in their, own, in their own right. But it really was more personal on this day, March 10, 1995. Um, it was just really surreal. It was like, um, you're ready for it, but the emotion takes over. And, and that's, what I, that's what I always say to, to any young player that if you want to play in a big game and you want to perform well in a big game is, is play the game, not the occasion. Because that was really on my mind too. But I, I really didn't want to let the fans down. I mean, there was a hell of a build up, as you know, and you know, the expectation was very high, so I didn't want to let people down. I didn't want to let myself down first and foremost. But I think it was a, it was such a relief for me too, because I was a little bit anxious in how my body was going to hold up. And um, yeah, I was lucky enough to get man of the match that night. Um, I don't read too much into that, but it, when I was getting old, I'm thinking, oh well, I must be doing something right, you know. And um, yeah, so that that was yeah, that was fantastic. And um, yeah, it was about playing well on the night and hopefully, hopefully getting a result, which unfortunately we didn't do. It was a, it was a great game, but th that's the other thing about it. I mean, you played 300 times plus as a professional overseas uh, for a lot of other teams before you could do it at home uh, in your hometown. Mm. Uh, when you look back on that now, um, do you have more of an appreciation for it? Or uh, how often have you reflected over the years when you watch the current crop do their thing or the past crop do their thing? And largely thanks, thanks to someone like yourself. Oh, I, I reflect on it all the time. Um, you know, I, I knew from a very early age in my career that it doesn't last forever. Mm. So all you have after your career is finished are memories. So yeah, of course, I mean, I, I'm, I'm blessed to have so many great memories, but that one there, um, that special moment walking out in 95 was, um, yeah, it's, um, it's hard to describe in a lot of ways, Monty. It was, um, it was, it was, I used to say back in those days, and young people now won't, won't know the enormity of a, a movie like Ben-Hur. It was bigger yeah. than Ben-Hur, you know, it was. It was, as I say, the build-up. I mean, you know, we, when they announced the first side, I remember the week before, you know, the, the days leading up to the game, we went uh, to this uh, place and, you know, it was a big sort of five-star evening dinner and everything, and then... Um, they had brought some people in from a movie set, you know, some special effects guys, yeah. and they had created a uh, Maori warrior's face on the stage, and it looked amazing. And then we had our meal and everything, and then they were going to announce the side, and then thunder and lightning started. It was just sort of it was deafening, and there was smoke going everywhere. And when that smoke cleared, the warrior's face had opened, and standing there was me, and the rest of the team that was going to go out that first night either side of me. And it was, oh, even now it's uh, tingling. Mate, it was showtime. We're going to get into showtime and uh, how big it was in the red carpet. No one expected the types of glamour, the glitz, uh, the red carpet, uh, the hype that you guys got. You were even above the All Blacks in terms of, um, you know, just wow. Uh, talk to me about it. What were your memories? Well, there's so many, Monty. Um, 
I mean, the, we were we were getting um, a profile like you'd never seen before. I mean, when I was growing up playing for Manukau, you know, we'd play at Carlo Park. There'd be a couple of thousand people there if you're lucky. Um, you you go in and go back to your club rooms, have a few lion reds or whatever it was, and you know, and that that was that was our our careers. You know, that was what we used to do for fun. But then this came about, and you know, I mean, obviously the All Blacks. That's the you know the uh, rugby union is our, our national sport, and uh, we didn't get a lot of attention. It used to really brass me off a lot of ways, especially when the Kiwis were successful under the Graham Lowe era. And I think um, it was nice to see that year that rugby league, no matter how they did it, you know, through marketing, through money, or spend a lot of money or whatever. I don't know. It just gave us that profile that I thought we deserved in a lot of ways. Yeah. You know, we've got a good sport and uh, we didn't get a, a you know, fair go from the media a lot of the times. When did you first hear of Auckland Warrior and you, the chance of you going back home to be a part of this all? Yeah, I was very much, you know, involved in uh, the, the Wigan Warriors for eight years as a player. And a couple of years before um, my last year there, I'd, I'd heard, you know, they'd signed John Money. you know, the Auckland Warriors were going to be, you know, the, the thing coming in, the new NRL side. Um, yeah, I thought I'd missed the boat, to be fair. I knew I was going to probably be too old in my own mind. Uh, so when, you know, Auckland was now, I was just I was just happy for New Zealand, you know. The, the, this is crazy. So you thought it had passed you by. You didn't even have any conversation or say, hey, can I be a part of this? Because I'm, you know, the humble man you are. You wouldn't say that you're a legend, but obviously... I just, I just find it hard that you didn't put your hand up and say, hey, I'm available. No, no, that's not me. You know, if people want me, they can ask. You know, it's I, um, it's not up to me to really put myself forward. I think, yeah. you know, what you do and your actions, that, that sort of counts for, you know, whether you get selected or not. And I remember John Money getting um, announced as a coach. And I, was, I said, well, well done, John. You know, he was a coach at Wigan at the time. And I remember um, one day after, after a training session at Wigan, he, uh, he said, Dean, can I have a word to you just in the car park? And he says, um, I want you to come back and captain the Warriors in the first season. I said, what? Me? You, are you sure? Um, yeah. And from that moment on, Ian Robson came over and yeah, just, yeah, just flowed from there. So from, I missed the boat to, wow, I'm the tip of the spear. Um, how did that make you feel, brother? Yeah, well, it's, it, 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 <laughs> He didn't, he didn't bring me back because I was at my best playing wise. Obviously, you know, um, I'd lost a bit of speed and it wasn't probably as, as, as sharp as I used to be. But, you know, when you, when you get older, you know yourself, Monty, you see the game a lot better. And he wanted an experienced person to help blood a lot of these young players that were coming through in Auckland mm. or in New Zealand. OK, now there was young players in Auckland, but there was also old players joining you, experienced players from the Super League. There was experienced players joining from the NRL. Mm -hmm. uh, bringing those guys together, was it an easier process? What did you find easy about it and what, and what did you find harder? Oh, I found what was easy was having other experienced guys around you. Um, you know, obviously not one person's going to make all the difference. Um, leadership is, is one thing, but, you know, I, I believe good leadership is having a number of people, you know, around you. And you know, you know, guys like Greg Alexander, you know, Phil Blake, um, and even Andy Platt, who unfortunately was injured most of that season. Um, Dennis Betts came along, but even Sean Hoppy, yeah. you know, um, Gene Namu had played quite a few games, you know. Then, even though he, you know, he wasn't old in years, he'd, he'd certainly played a lot of uh, NRL games, you know. So um, those those guys knew what it was like. It was really the the younger guys that hadn't played the NRL football that I've obviously had a lot to learn. It's, it's funny, um, you know, I meet guys like Joe Vagana, you know, and, and, and Logan Swan and things like that. And um, I didn't know at the time, but they were watching me. They were watching me, how I was responding to the training and, and things like that. And I just did what I did. You know, I'm still the boy from South Auckland. I'm still, you know, just doing what I need to do. You know, and that's training hard. That's, you know, doing the right thing, preparing for games well. And um, it's not until I, I came back a number of years ago that I used to bump into these guys and they used to talk about how they used to watch me. John Money, you knew him well. Um, did he change at all as a coach over there to the one that was over here? And how, how good a job did you think he did in your mind? Because, I mean, he's still got 50% win ratio, which is, I think, <laughs> second highest yeah. uh, in the career of uh, Warriors coaches. Yeah. Um, yeah, he just brought a lot of calmness. Mm. And I think that, that was a big thing, that John was really calm. So... 
with all the hype that we had and all the marketing that was going on, it was sort of, you could easily get carried away. And I suppose just having him there sort of just put a nice sort of balance and calmness to it. How good was it having your Wigan Warrior boys there? Because there was a few that, that came at different times uh, when you're there, not all came at once, but uh, you know, uh, the likes of Bodica, the likes mm. of Platt, the likes of uh, Betts. Mm. I mean, that, that must have been huge. You're going back home, but you're taking uh, your home away from home, bringing it back with you. Yeah, I, I think having those, having those kind of players and other players I've played with for the, for, during my Kiwi uh, era as well is trust mm. to me. You know, when you've got that trust in the people around you that they're going to do their job, to me, that's the key to having a successful side. If, if I could trust them, because they certainly could trust me, yeah. but if I could trust them, I wanted them to know that they had to do their job, you know, and then I could. So I, I did put a lot of pressure on, on a lot of them. Um, and hey, look, because if they don't do their job, they make me look, mm. like, look bad. You know, I love that. So, how would they gain your trust, and how would you put pressure on them to go? You know what, you pass, you pass the test. I'd talk to them. You know, and it sort of really annoys me these days that someone makes a mistake, kicks the ball out in the full or whatever, and they go up and shake his hand and pat him on mm. the back. You know, if I did something like that, I'd put my hand up and say, "Hey, I'll make up for that." Yeah. And that's what I want out of my players. You know, to make sure that that's the attitude they had. Because um, we all make mistakes. That's, there's nothing wrong with that, you know. And there's no, there's, I've never seen a perfect player, but it, it's your response to it, you know. Mm. To me, that's more important. You're going down to play with some of the best of the best in the NRL on your side, first of all. So well, let's go through some of those names. Um, Greg Alexander, uh, memories of him and uh, mm. what he could do. Well, he was a special player. You know, he was he was up there with some of the best that's ever been. You know. Um, you know the the qualities the, that he had, and and he, he was a good friend too. I you know when I was at the Warriors, I used to bump into him. You know when he was doing sort of commentary and that, and you know he had some great memories of the Warriors. It was something that he cherished, and he he really sort of valued that his time here. And um, yeah, but he was he was a class player, very classy. He could he could do things that a lot of players couldn't do. You know he had silky skills. He had great speed, um, even even in his mature years. Yeah, Phil Blake. Now I've heard many stories about him about doing a thousand push-ups, thousand sit-ups, thousand chins. I mean, this guy was just a, an animal before and after training. Um, uh, and I, I, you know, got got a chance to, to speak to him a few times when I was one of the younger players on scholarships. But um, you know, what, what was he like to play with? Ultimate competitor, perhaps? Yeah, I, I wouldn't. I wouldn't sort of describe Phil like that. I'd actually describe Phil as a as, as a really classy. Uh, naturally gifted player, really, you know. Um, he didn't sort of, he, he, to me, he wasn't one of those guys how you're describing there. He was sort of a little bit different because he would try things, you know. Um, and he, he, he was born with that. He would run 90 miles an hour that way and chip the ball back that way and regather it and score a try. I mean, yeah, he had, he had something special. I love Billy Slater, right? Yes. He was a bit yes. of an innovator. Yeah. For you as a local hero returning, uh, what was it like seeing the talent? Uh, seeing the talent on board, the, name some names, what you saw, what you liked, and um, was, was it a surprise to you? Um, I don't think it was a surprise. I think, you know, back in those days, New Zealand was always producing good juniors. You know, and just coming through the local competition too. So, you know, it wasn't like we were getting our Kiwi sides from NRL and Super League. We were getting them from the local... Yeah you know, the local club sides. I remember Tony Taps and, and what he did in terms of the star-studded names you had in the side, but yeah. he was an absolute brutal, just yeah. broke tackles and he was amazing on the yeah. edge. Who, who else surprised you, whether it be in training or, or on the field? Yeah, I'm, I'm glad you mentioned Taps, actually. He, he, was, he was a revelation, really. And, you know, guys like Hytro Cassini, he ran as hard in the first minute yeah. as he did in the last minute. You know what I mean? It's just... And I, I love that, that, having that attitude that I'm going to bend the line, I'm going to get us full going forward and all that. And just no self-preservation, is there, you know? And, but when those tough moments come along, I want to see who's putting their hand up. Mm. And, um, you know, those are the guys I like. And C.S. Sol uh, Solomona, you know? Um, he just he was wonderful to watch, you know? He could, he could run like the wind, but he was big as a house, you know? And, I mean, you had guys like Nigel Vagana. 
Yeah, actually, and I've always told this to Nigel every time I see him. I says, you were the reason I didn't take that second year, right? Really? Yeah, because we, we used to do sort of sprint training. Yeah. And I was, I was coming a metre and a half behind him or, or something like that, which as sprinters, no, that's not, a, that's not a lot. But I was always at the front, but I was obviously getting old and I was slowing down. And then I thought, nah, I can't go around again, even though that offered me another year. But um, it's funny how you judge yourself against people. You know what's going to happen now? Nigel's going to cop some flack now because uh, Warrior Number One could have been there for a year longer now, but it's because of um, Nigel's fault. <laughs> but you know, like, but but that's the thing, right? Yeah. Like, legends like yourself reinvent yourself. So you moved in from the centres, mm. you played a bit of loose forward at times. Um, but I suppose that is just the mindset that you have that if you can't be your absolute best to contribute. Yeah. Uh, to this jumper, uh, yeah. although new, uh, you absolutely loved. Um, it's just not the yeah, way. Yeah, I mean, I didn't want to retire too early, but when I knew I couldn't do what I wanted to do, that's the moment that I knew my time is up. Because um, you don't want to drop your standards, you know, and uh, it's, it's really important to me, you know, I played with a lot of pride, you know. I wasn't the fastest, I wasn't the strongest. Um, but no one wanted it more than me. That's, that's, that was my attitude. And, and desire is everything, you know? And, and, and effort is something that you can control. You can't control, you know, sort of natural ability that you're born with, you know? I had to work hard to get what I had. I was pretty happy with my last game, you know, just my performance. Uh, there was no fanfare, nobody said anything. Yeah. And I just picked up my boots and just chucked them in the bin and that was it. Uh, that was that was the finish of my uh, my footy career. So, and I remember even Stephen Kearney um, when I le left the Auckland Warriors, he gave me a letter and he says, oh, "I want you to read this on the plane when you were going back to the UK." And I thought, "Oh, okay." You know, I'd, I'd, he'd been a roommate of mine, one of my roommates. Yeah. You know, John Cohen had been a roommate. You know, there have been quite a few, and um, it was just this heartfelt letter. For anyone that knows Mox is, you know, he's a he's a really deep sort of passionate guy. You know, he's very passionate about the game and how he sees the game and that. Mm. And there was this beautiful letter, and I've still got it, you know. And it was just saying thank you for, you know, the leadership you showed, the example you were, and all that. And I was just so humbled by it. What's your memories of Stace? I mean, did mm. you know he was going to be, in my opinion, uh, the greatest to ever put on the jumper at the club? I, mm -hmm. I mean, you see these guys in the background, local boys, which is nicer. Uh, your memories of him back then? Yeah, a lot of good memories of Stacey. I mean, you know, he was a young guy coming through, what was he, 17 at the time or something like that. And um, there I was, 33 years of age, and I'm thinking, gee, this, I, I, I could be his father, you know, the, such was the age gap. But it was, um, yeah, it was really nice to see a young player like that, of that quality, getting the chance to. I think mm. that was a big thing. Uh, it was, would have been so easy not to put him in the side. But hey, um, you know, if you've got the quality, you know, you'll, you'll get in there. And, um, and, and watch him develop throughout the years. I, yeah, I, I felt really proud um, to have played sort of just a tiny mm. part in, in, um, in uh, his career. But um, I remember telling him once, because um, he used to put his, his hands behind his head and, you know, take a breather. You know, after he had yeah. worked in it, you remember that? That's that like, you can remember that. You know, especially you, you'd you'd been playing alongside him. He also him. used to do that on the plane when he was hung over from the night before. <laughs> he used to put his legs up in the little seat and struggle all the way yeah. home. But anyway, but I, I told him, no, Stacey, don't do that, because that's showing the opposition that you're tired. And you know what? Didn't listen to me. <laughs> <laughs> for the, for the rest of his career, I could see him doing it. You know, and I thought, yeah, I made no impact there, but. Um, yeah, every time I see him, I'm, you know, he's always laughing and smiling. He's got that, I hope, hopefully he continues that. It might be a bit harder now that he's head coach, but um, yeah, he's, he's one of the success stories of the Warriors and, and what it can do for you as a person too. Because you know, you, know, you know yourself, mate, that it's not only, you know, what people see, it's, it's you behind, behind the screen yeah. and behind doors really, you know, it, it develops you, it develops you in a way that um, makes, makes your character stronger, you know, and, um, and if, you, if you, you know, you treat the game well, it'll treat you well as well. And I think, you know, that's, that's the way I've sort of taken it all my life. Do you know, what, what areas did the team get right in 95 and maybe fall, fall a little bit short in? The travelling? 
That was that was big, you know. I mean, I remember our, our first away game and it was about 40 degrees when you got over there. And even though, you know, we planned it meticulously and everything, it was, um, it was der- very difficult to get used to. Um, you know, it's not far, is it? But that time difference... You know, are you having enough sort of water? Are you, you know, what sort of meals should we be having? So that that was a lot of a learning, a bit of a big learning curve there in that year. And I suppose we just about won enough games. I think, you know, that was... You did. <laughs> you had enough. There was one change uh, that you made that was extra and you were winning the game by 30 points. Yeah. And Joe Vangana was sitting right there when he said uh, he was the change. It was John Money uh, who made that change and you guys didn't make the playoffs. Yeah. In a lot of ways, it was pretty sad. Um, heart on heart, though, I, I, did, I didn't think we were ready for it. Mm. But, you know, you, 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 know you, you get some momentum sometimes and you don't know no matter what happens. You know, you can win the first game and then it just sort of continues, you know. So, yeah, it was, it was a bit sad. But I, I was pleased with the platform that we'd set for that year. Yeah. You know, I thought it was good. It was um, encouraging. Um, and who, who knows what was going to happen in the future. I don't know if you sh- thought about the future much or what it was going to be like uh, yeah. before you, you went out that tunnel in that game, but, you know, 27 years later, um, was it what you expected from this Warriors side? Um, I, I, it's always going to be difficult um, just because of the lack of pathways that we have for our players here um, and, and to get... You know, I know firsthand how hard it is to get quality players to come over to New Zealand. Mm. And um, so really, your, your best chance of success is developing your own. And I think, you know, the, the team that got us into the grand final or two grand finals that we've had, there was a lot of local players there, especially in the first one. It's always going to be difficult, and but the expectation is always there. I think there are other teams in the NRL that maybe don't even have as good a record of make, making the playoffs than the Warriors. But, hey, we're one country behind one team. The expectation is going to be high. Once a warrior, always a warrior. Uh, warrior number one and our first ever captain, thank you for everything you've done to, to pave the way for this club, uh, you know, who's still going 27 years later. Thanks, Monty, and thanks for having me. I've enjoyed it. Coming up on the show next week, uh, don't be fooled. He was an absolute brute on the field, but off the field, very gentle and very much a character. Join us next week on Once a Warrior, where I talk to Jerry Seal.